Okay, so this is Carol and I'm continuing my talk about Leonardo and I'm tagging on a little bit about Michelangelo's David. So these are the additional references that I used as I sort of continued on. I wanna make a couple comments. Um, the Malcolm Gladwell YouTube is really fascinating. And I also wanna just uh, flag that the PBS Medici um, program was, um, I thought a little bit hyperbolic, but we can go on. I thought it would be fun to start with seeing how the artists viewed themselves. And Michelangelo painted his face on the St. Bartholomew figure, which is in the uh, Last Judgment of Christ. The uh, painting, the sketch on the left is purported to be Leonardo's self-portrait, although Martin Kemp, who is a um, Leonardo um, expert and art historian, has questioned whether or not this is actually Leonardo or a picture that he made of his father, and it has to do with how the kind of aging that he sees in this painting. But for now, we're saying that it's a self-portrait. In contrast, I thought it'd be fun to see how um, Raphael viewed them. They're both in the um, same painting. Oopsie, I don't know how to do that. The School of Athens. And you can see Michelangelo is here as Heraclitus sitting by himself, kind of a brooding figure He's in the classic kind of thinker pose as his head is supported on his arm, um, but he's by himself. And Leonardo is very sociable. He's, he's uh, figure is Plato. He's center stage. You know, he's uh, where your eye is directed in terms mm. of um, vanishing points. And he's surrounded by lots of people. I wanted to just quickly review the Renaissance um, continuing from what I had my earlier lecture, Renaissance starts in Italy, and that's both for geographical and social political reasons. It becomes a pan-European movement later, and that's kind of a way of looking at the Renaissance as being a continuum. It moves across, it has to move across the Alps for one thing, and that's again the, a geographical, social, political um, issue. But Leonardo and Michelangelo are also part of a philosophical and artistic continuum. The medieval philosophy being the great chain of being, of uh, the humanist philosophy where Leonardo and, and Michelangelo are, are solidly um, um, identified as being humanists. But part of that movement is, is uh, there's, there's some back and forth obviously, and that humanist movement sets up um, the enlightenment which is the more modern period. And the reason I wanted to come back to talk about the Mona Lisa and the David is because I think it's, it's interesting to view them as um, conveying the cultural thinking and the mores of that Italian Renaissance. This is just a, I just really like this uh, map because it shows how early on how Marco Polo probably um, traveled across the Silk Road. And you can see that they're coming down from Genoa through the Aegean Sea and across uh, back to the mainland and into um, Asia. And this is an easier, uh, clearer picture of what that water route would have been. Um, the Aegean Sea, actually the water, the flow of the water comes down the Eastern side it actually crosses, the, the current will cross over to the Western side and hit Italy again, and then move back across. But you can see how easy it would be. Well, easy for me to say, cause I'm not on that boat, but to get to Constantinople from Italy. And that again is Italy, as you can see is a peninsula on a peninsula. And there's lots of port towns along the way which would make trade really important. And that, I'm gonna skip that one, really, is why, uh, why the Renaissance flourished in Italy. The, um, cause it was the first port of call as it were for lots of the trade. Coming out of um, medieval time, this is, these are two different images of the great chain of, of being. The great chain of being of course was what 
the church was how the church was um, organizing and controlling what the uh, population was was taught it, it established and it maintained order so god's at the top and angels are below them and it goes on down humans are below that and at the very bottom there are um, stones they really stratified everything what's kind of fun to see is that every single strata is further subdivided so the angels had seraphim and cherubim and it goes on down to i think cherubs um, this was how they maintained um, order and the church said god gave us these rules and they established the hierarchy and this is the way that we are all our levels of importance the great chain of being starts to lose credibility there's there are several things that come in to um, confluence at that time one of them it becomes clear that the church can't save their congregants from the plague. So the plague is just uh, decimating people without regard to wealth or stature and the uh, church can't save any of them no matter what. There's also a new rising merchant class that is particularly powerful in Florence but because Italy is divided vertically through the, um, I think it's pronounced Alpines, um, our Apennines mountain range, there, there aren't the same kind of um, nobility and inherited wealth that goes on in, in uh, the rest of Europe. And this kind of um, merchant class is coming from the trade that's coming from east, from the east. And when the Ottoman Empire falls, the humanists who are um, who have been thriving in Count Constantinople move to um, Italy. They are escaping the Islamists, and they bring their their humanist philosophy and their teachings, and become the tutors to the wealthy children in Italy. So the, these children are learning this. Um, and oopsie, can't find my little cursor. Um, Oops, John, I'm sort of, okay, there we go. Um, the city dwellers are also, because these are cities that are growing up and developing in Europe, in Italy, it provides a kind of anonymity that you don't get when you're in, um, in a uh, land-based uh, place, like, like uh, towns that, that, or they weren't towns, they were um, where nobles were in control of fiefdoms. Um, and because they're, they are mobile, it's hard to track parentage, it's hard to track um, somebody's inheritance. And so you could write your own story and that's really important. I am, don't know why I can't find my cursor. But cl uh, click on the slide, uh, click right in the middle there of the we slide. Yeah. Okay. You, but you I can probably really also use so your right. Go. And left arrow on your keyboard just to go between slides. I would Thank assume. you. That would be so much easier. Um, so just a quick review. The power of, of Florence comes from really the Medici. The Medici are bankers to the Catholic Church, and um, there's actually a, a, a very dramatized version in the PBS um, story about how they become the bankers to the Catholic Church. But there are two really important benefits. Medici banking rules, one that they don't loan to the kings or princes because they're bad credit risks, and that their um, regional bank managers had to invest. So they had skin in the game in their own, so they were invested in their own banks. Also, the accounting system allowed the bankers to, to track debts and credits. You knew exactly what somebody was worth at the time. The Medici likely returned their retained their um, will trade, which was extremely lucrative. They also became the purveyor of alum, which was necessary for dyes. So how they could color different fabrics. And just as a reminder, as, as um, Tina had mentioned earlier, if you heard that, the um, florin was one of the two coinages of the realm. It was a coinage of um, trade. It was one of the two that were trusted. So that's one, one question, Carol, before you go on. So yeah. back at that slide, that's really interesting to me that they that the Medici tried to or 
or set a policy of not loaning to kings or princes. Yeah, I was going to ask I, the same. <laughs> I'm I'm very interested in how they they were not uh, forced or intimidated since the kings and princes were in control of soldiers, etc. How did that happen? Because the kings and uh, because mostly um, they had so much money from the Catholic Church. Ah, so they were the, and the Catholic Church ruled the you know they had so much power over over kings and princes and they could they could right right and and that's the age-old yeah conflict between the church and the kings and, right yeah okay right. great thank you well, I think okay. that's how that went oh is sorry is that also a policy because they just won't get paid back is yeah, that yeah. Right? yeah okay okay now I've like totally gone somewhere completely wacky um there we go okay so one of the Medici, one of the, the things that the Medici um, did was they kept their heads down. This was a, this was a policy that Cosimo de' Medici actually um, taught his, his children, which was to keep your uh, power in the background. And they were very careful to do that. So they redistributed their wealth by, um, by having um, popular pageants, they entertain the population. But when they did build something, they made sure that people realized that they had actually funded it. And this is an example of one of the things that they did for the population in general. They built this hospital for orphans. It was designed by Brunelleschi, supposedly commissioned by the artist Arte, Arte della Setta. Did I say that right, Irene? Um, and uh, but they funded it and fast forward 500 years <laughs> and the Berkeley main post office on Center Street in Berkeley loosely designed their building on this, um, on the Brunelleschi design. That's awesome. Isn't that great? That's, yeah. That's I really wonder cool. if Julia Morgan had anything to do with that. Oh, that would be interesting. I don't know. I didn't read research that. Um, anyway, I want to go forward to this book. So this is Richard Thompson Fort, who was actually a law professor at Stanford. But he has just published this book called Dress Codes. And he talks about the sumptuary laws, the laws of, that govern clothing. And you can see the development of um, European clothing and I, this is ending about the middle, late Middle Ages, early, depending on how you count it, early Renaissance. Um, what he says in this book that I'm particularly landing on is, quote, fashion is a way of communicating ideas, values, and aspirations through clothes. And I suggest that art then freezes, portraiture freezes those messages and those codes on canvas. So if we know what those sumptuary laws are. Um, again, you probably already know this, is, is that when they devised um, dyes and they could figure out how to get purple, um, which I, if I'm remembering correctly, it comes from a certain kind of shell that is found in Italy. That's so rare that it symbolizes, it was used only for, for someone who could claim noble birth. Um, and in 1322, Florentine law, for instance, only allowed widows to wear black. Cosimo de' Medici says that, according to Machiavelli, uh, Medici, uh, Cosimo supposedly said, one can make a gentleman with two yards of red cloth. And I think, again, just going back to what a city is and the mobility that the city allowed you that was not possible in feudal times is that you could arrive in a new town and if you were dressed to look like a noble person, you were assumed to be a noble person. Um, by the 17th century, Florence had over 20 sumptuary laws. So that was a way, again, of um, trying to define social stature since the great chain of being was being unlinked, as it were. That gets us to the Mona Lisa. Um, 
the Mona Lisa is actually painted on poplar wood. It's not canvas. And it's very small. It's a 30 inch by 20 inch um, painting. And that's really good because Leonardo hauled it around with him for years. And, it, and it's actually in his possession when he dies in France. And by the way, it is owned by France, which is, which is why it's in the Louvre. Women at that time had one of three roles. They could be virgins, they could be wives, or they could be widows. So you can see they're defined by their relationship to the males in their lives. They were married for, um, they were married off to cement alliances. Uh, they were required by their husbands to produce heirs. And they could be a very valuable commodity, especially if they were wealthy, because you could create that kind of alliance. Um, portraits at that time were used sometimes to vet potential brides. So, and that kind of uh, um, portrait would be, there would be signals in the painting itself to let you know that this is a, a young virgin. Um, so portraits were a marker of also significant events. Um, and they were a two-dimensional declaration of, uh, of the patron's stature or their wealth. And it's all in the coding in the, the painting itself. The painter, and what's unique about the Mona Lisa is that she's one of the first paintings where she's actually facing us. We can see her full face instead of being in profile, which is what the um, style was in the medieval times. So I wanna look at clothing here. Um, the um, Lisa Garadini, the Mona Lisa is married to a wealthy silk merchant and her outfit is clearly expensive but not ostentatious. And this is also um, not, this is clothing that a wealthy woman would wear not outside because that would be, she would wear something actually more um, elaborate, but this isn't what she would wear when she was just governing her household. She would, she was apparently would be dressed in something probably muslin so that she could move about and, and tell her servants what to do. This is something showing that she's wealthy enough to um, stay, to sit for a painting, which took a long time. So it's a very understated but luxurious kind of outfit and Leonardo paints her in a dark silk damask gown. And it's underneath a sheer overground, which is called a uh, Guarnello. And the Guarnello is slit at the sleeves. And you can see another silk garment, which is covering her forearms. Um, now, there's also a dark velvet band, which I'm not sure where they're call telling us this is, but the band tells us according to Richard Thompson Ford, that she was recently pregnant. And we also know that she recently had a child because her hair is bound by a dark silk veil. Now it looks like her hair is hanging loose, which would be something that a virgin would, uh, someone who's not married would, uh, that was her style. But apparently you can see this little band across her forehead and um, the, the art historians say that this is actually a very uh, transparent silk um, kind of net that covers her hair. The other piece of this that's interesting is she is, um, she signaled that, or the signaling is that she is a um, married woman and that she's very modest because of her, the positioning of her hands. She is, um, her right hand is draped over her left. And so even though she's not wearing a ring, that's supposedly telling us that she is um, a modest and faithful and devoted wife. Interestingly, in twen uh, 2006, there was infrared camera work that proved that the Mona Lisa was originally going to have her hands resting on her chair, but that Leonardo changed the position, right? And I couldn't find any, anything that said any, that gave us any more detail than that. Um, also, there was recent, recent restoration um, research that uncovered three things that we no longer see. One is uh, that she had originally been painted with a pearl headdress and 
that she also had eyelashes and eyebrows. They think that the eyelashes and eyebrows were probably um, washed out by over vigorous cleaning. But the headdress, the pearl headdress, they think was actually scrubbed off and then she was overpainted. So they took that pearl headdress off, which I think is really interesting because her, um, it makes you wonder what the pearl, what, how, how elaborate that headdress was because pearls usually connoted uh, chastity or purity um, with, it was kind of a virtuous signal. Um, when, you, when you say they, who, who do you mean? Like they it, took it off. We, um, I couldn't find out who or when that was done, but it was done over probably, I don't know how, how it wasn't Leonardo. It was post Leonardo. So I don't really, I couldn't find out who actually did it, but that is a great question. If I find, if I can find out, I will get I will. I will ask my cousin who used to be the director for the art patrimoine for Paris. So oh, I'll fantastic. Shoot. I'll that shoot her an email. Yeah. Okay. That would be uh, I guess more is that like a pretty common practice where the yeah. you know the painter would finish and then the owner would be like, I don't like this. Someone <laughs> take this out yeah. for me. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> I, I I don't think it was uncommon. Um, the other interesting thing about it is that that it was considered a mark of beauty to have a very long neck. And I don't think that he elongated her neck. I think he just pretty much left it. Um, there's also a really, really uh, great story about how the Mona Lisa, um, there was an Italian who thought that it, it had been stolen and he, so he steals it and brings it, uh, brings the Mona Lisa to Italy. And there is this whole story about maybe that's why she's so famous because he was so famous in having stolen it. Um, yeah, so I really, really look forward to, this, to finding out what that was. Yeah. what that whole story was. Um, okay, let me see if I can, there. Um, quickly, you can see the headdress. This is Clarice um, Orsini. She is married to Lorenzo the Magnificent. There's lots of Lorenzo, so it's hard to keep track of them all. But um, you can see that her headdress is quite elaborate. It is pearl studded and her hair is completely covered it's completely bound up so um that is indicates that she's married and interestingly uh this is Gerland Isle who's painted this so and she again has very very luxurious kind of clothing um but she's not actually looking straight at us she doesn't look particularly happy either um but she is an example of a woman who's married to someone very, very powerful. She brought in um, a lot of wealth. She, this was again, an arranged marriage because she was um, part of Rome, Roman nobility. And it was unusual for a Florentine of Lorenzo's stature to marry outside of uh, Florence, but that was what was arranged for her. So, um, Back to the Mona Lisa. It's just that at the uh, at the end of it all, what what? Uh, oopsie, this is like really out of control here. Um, um, at what Michelangelo was really signaling us. I mean, what uh, Leonardo was signaling us is that that uh, uh, Leo jo Leo. Gioconda, La Gioconda is a virtuous wife. Um, she's very wealthy and that she has, they're memorializing the birth of a child, which some people say it's her third child and some people, most people say, call it her second child. I'm gonna skip over Clarice and move on to um, Michelangelo. This is just a really brief, uh, comparison between the two of them. Leonardo was considered a polymath. Michelangelo considered himself a sculptor who sometimes painted, but he was actually far more than that. Uh, they were, uh, as far as I can tell, Leonardo never painted nudes. Michelangelo 
had nudes all over the place. Um, and Leonardo didn't have any signed works. Um, Michelangelo signed La Pieta, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But mostly they didn't sign them because the population knew who painted and who created what. And the only artwork of Michelangelo's that I wanted to talk about was, um, is the David. There's a whole thing of Michelangelo is early identified as a um, genius and he is apprenticed to Ghirlandaio. Uh, Ghirlandaio sends him to the Medici household where he ends up being uh, catching Le Lorenzo's eye. And Lorenzo has, has uh, Michelangelo brought into his household and educated with his children. So he's, he is more classically educated than Leonardo was. They, the Med uh, Lorenzo dies, uh, Savonrolo, Rola, Savonrola um, comes to power. The Medici are thrown out of Florence. They come back to Florence. And when they come back to Florence, Michelangelo comes back and he is commissioned to build or to, to um, carve the David. Um, he, the David is, is a very um, popular and, and beloved and identified with Florence um, figure. He's, he is, uh, Michelangelo is, um, he is commissioned to carve the David and it is intended to be one of 12 Old Testament figures which are gonna decorate the buttresses of the Florence Cathedral. Um, it's commissioned by the Office of Works of Florence, uh, which is a committee essentially of, of the Wool Cloth Guild, of which remember there are like two versions of there are the cloth merchants and the cloth, uh, uh, the ones who actually made the cloth out of wool. So clearly Michelangelo, while he doesn't do the number of uh, dissections and with the kind of intensity that Leonardo was pop, was known for, he knew his surface anatomy. Um, but you can see, and it's very clear, this is an incredibly powerful sculpture. He has a very large, ex except for there are these two distortions. He's got an oversized head for this body and he's got oversized hands, particularly you can see it in his right hand. Um, when Michelangelo, three years later, completes the sculpture, it's recognized immediately as being extraordinarily beautiful and, um, and also impossibly engineering, in terms of engineering, impossible to get up onto the buttress. And so the, there is a committee formed of about 30 people, of which actually Leonardo was one. And they have to decide where in Florence they're gonna place this incredible and very powerful statue. And they decide that it should be placed instead of on top of the Duomo, which would have been up here on the buttress. Um, and, and the reason this is up here is because in 2010, they had a festival in which case they made a um, fiberglass replica and they sort of flew him around by crane and put him in various places, but that's where he was supposed to have been. Um, and you can see he wouldn't have been very easily visible up that high. Um, they decided to put him at the Palazzo Vecchio, which is the uh, seat of government. And I couldn't get a very good uh, image of this, but that, so apologies for the quality here. The David was a very, very, um, popular image in Florence. It's kind of identified with Florence. And, um, and I think what makes the David, why they put him there and why, uh, outside of the fact that he's just a very powerful work of art and so lots of people would be able to see him is because that, um, because of, it's a, I think you could say it was a political statement or there's conjecture that it was a political statement. Um, representations of David were really popular, but what makes Michelangelo's unique is because he is before he's had this battle with Goliath. 
His weight's on his back leg. He's uh, alert, but he's not aggressive. He's um, assessing what to do next. His sling is um, not prominent. It's nearly hidden. In the earlier slides, you could see it over one of his, um, one of the buttocks muscles. But David exudes confidence. He's also nude. And that's not completely accepted at that time. But what Michelangelo is quoted as saying is what spirit is so empty and blind that it cannot recognize the fact that the foot is more noble than the shoe and skin more beautiful than the garment with which it is clothed. So nudity was beginning to become accepted as a celebration of the human form. Um, again, being legitimized by being in keeping with Roman and Greek statuary. Um, however, and I couldn't find out who did this, so I really need to ask your um, cousin about this. At, at some point within the same kind of, of time frame of his being placed, I believe, or the implication was that, that there were three additions made to this David. The tree stump behind David's right leg was gilded in gold and the sling, which is not very visible, was also gilded in gold. And the third piece addresses the nudity, which is that there was a gilded gold garland that was supposedly covering his loins. And I haven't been able to find a picture of that. Tina, maybe you know more about it, but um, so he was, his modesty was increased. So it, what I, the way that I like to think about this is um, David symbolizes courage, that he's a small and apparently defenseless, but very confident force. He is aimed at looking towards Rome, which was regarded as being a, more, a much larger and much more powerful threat to Florence, which was actually also true. Um, now, the Malcolm Gladwell reference that I had is that Malcolm Gladwell has a revisionist version of the David and Goliath story. So if you remember that revisionist version of it, it would be more accurate perhaps to consider that David was a thoughtful strategic warrior capable and, and in fact did defeat a much larger and seemingly more powerful foe. The other piece that uh, Malcolm Gladwell makes uh, brings up is that research on slingers who were uh, like a, a military force, like there would be archers, there would be a, a group of slingers in your, in your uh, war, I don't know what you would call them, like a battalion or something. Um, the research on those, um, those people reveals that the sling, which is not a slingshot, but it's a sling, uh, they would release projectiles that could travel with the force of a 45 millimeter handgun. They were going about 23 meters per second and they could go like over 200 yards. They were incredibly accurate and very, very um, deadly. So what do we know about the Renaissance from, uh, from the David? I think that it's signaling that nudity is beginning to be accepted. So there's, there's an acceptance of the human em humanist emphasis on the glory of the human body. Um, art could be used as a political statement that there was enough wealth in, um, in Florence so that they could commission a work like this and they could, uh, and that artists were not yet really signing their work because the population was educated enough in terms of the artwork around them so they didn't need to. Um, but this is the exception that proves the rule. There's this detail in La Pieta. Um, and the story behind this is on the sash that's across Mary's chest is Michelangelo's signature. And he did this after he made, um, after the statue was in, in place. And he did this because he overheard two citizens in Florence crediting his work to somebody else. And that made him so angry that he went in and carved his name in his um, in the statue itself. So 
about 250, 270 years after it was placed, the David was placed in front of the Palacio, they had to move it indoors to protect the marble. So that's where you can see it much more closely and there is no gold gilding on it. Um, so that's my quick romp through the David and um, the Mona Lisa. Can I ask a question, yeah. a general question about, um, uh, I guess, the statues from the Renaissance? So, like, I feel like I've heard that all those ancient, well, yeah, wait, that they no. were closed, that or, or that that stuff was painted, right? So you see these old uh -huh. ancient statues, and they yes. were they were painted, but then we've come to see them now that all the paint has gone away. We think of like uh, that. Um, I guess art form is being like white marble or whatever. Right. So in the Ren Ren in the Renaissance, were they still doing like was this originally painted, or did they kind of take on that style of just having it be just the marble itself without any? Right. So I heard the same thing. Is that um, um, that that what we thought, what we think of now as having been these these uh, white marble statues that they either had real clothing on them or they were painted. Um, so I've also heard that. The David, the only references to having changed anything here is the gold gilding. So I think that it probably depends on how far along they are. Like, I don't know who put, who gilded this with gold. And like you said before, I think that if you owned it, you did whatever you wanted with it because I don't think there was the same kind of reference for the work of the artist in particular. They they were um, they were becoming important. Um, certainly, if you had if you wanted to commission a work and you could get Leonardo to paint your your portrait or and and he would refuse painting uh, portraits regularly and he didn't really seem to care who who um, was making the request. Um, that was a, that was a symbol of you know your your ability to convince him to do that. But then once you had it, you could do what you wanted. Like somebody, the the um, the restorators uh, who have been doing research are very uh, certain that the Mona Lisa had a pearl headdress and that it was painted over. So it wasn't. It, they don't seem to be thinking that, unlike uh, the Mona Lisa's crossed hands, that that was something that Leonardo did. They're not saying that about the headdress. So my speculation is that, and it is speculation, is that um, that some things, some of the, like the David, was actually nude, except for those uh, guild, uh, gilded editions. So it's a really interesting question because we don't really, I don't really know. I don't, really, haven't really heard, seen anything more recent or that, that uh, I, I know more about. So Irene, maybe your cousin would know, would be able to know something. Maybe. Tim, Tim do you remember in, in uh, Brazil, how many of those uh, little cherubs, they put clothes on them, little, little uh, drawing covers? Yeah. No, and, I don't remember that. Oh, you don't remember that? They no. would cover the Catholic churches. They would cover uh, little, cherub, little cherubs groins. <laughs> that's funny. Right, right, right. And also, wasn't Leonardo 21 when he carved David? He was. He, I'm um, not Leonardo. Michelangelo. Michelangelo. Wasn't he 21? Let's see, I think he was, um, Tina, do you know off the top of your head? I didn't, oh, the other thing that's really interesting is Leonardo's like an entire generation older than Michelangelo. So, um, so yeah, I think he's in his early twenties when he's, he's carving it. He's, and he lives to be quite a long time, you know, to be quite old actually, Michelangelo does. He dies much later. So yeah, incredibly young, oopsie. Um, speaking of speaking of age, I'm fascinated that the David was outside for something like 300 years. 
Is Almost. that right? Yeah. So when they moved it indoors, you know, when I went to see the David 40 years ago, it looked perfect. So wasn't, him. wasn't the marble, <laughs> what? They cleaned him. They cleaned him. Yeah, they cleaned him good. Yeah, uh -huh. but um, how about pitting and, you know, erosion of the marble from being outdoors for 300 years? Yeah. So that's why they moved him indoors because he was. No, no, no. I get that. But there must yeah. have been cu cu accumulated damage by the time they moved him indoors. And it yeah. wasn't apparent when I saw him. No, because they, 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 uh, what would you call it? Restored. They restored him. Oh. Yeah. They did a lot of restoration. And it's a big, oopsie. Is that Tina? Yes. He was 20, and he was 26 when, when this was carved. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> he's remarkably remarkably young and remarkably talented yeah uh, right and also notoriously grumpy uh, <laughs> like he's not your jolly fellow that happens when you're just way too talented too young yeah <laughs> okay so we have, more, to uh, we have to get I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> but, uh, at the end of this i'll send you all a uh, uh, I don't know if you saw a number of years ago, there was a restoration of a Spanish painting of, of Jesus. It's very funny that someone tried to restore it. Oh, that would uh, be great. Uh, oh, it's, it's hilarious. Uh, it was on like Colbert and stuff, but uh, yeah, I'll send that later. That would be really great. I, it's, it's just, it's, I mean, cause they're trying to, they're trying to stay, they're trying to not, not damage anything but the restorations is just amazing i mean that kind of work is really really hard <clears throat> and what how they do it is really difficult yeah okay so tina it's all yours mic drop to tina yes thank you so now how do i unshare oh stop share there i am there so now is. we can go to tina and i think john are you going to be sharing this yeah, so give me just a, a, a second to make sure that I've got... I'm sorry, Tina, I went on very long. No, it's okay. That was very, very entertaining, very interesting, and very informative. Thank you. Thank you, Thank but you. you have much more. Okay, I'm almost ready here. But, um, if this is just going to be brief until we, we don't want to keep people too long. I think we started late and I went on so so no do you so want to John do you want to do this next week yeah no uh, uh, just get us started Tina okay and then, I'm just gonna I just okay. wanted to welcome you all <laughs> and tell you that I am a distant relative to Michelangelo di Lovicchio Buonadotti Simoni just kidding <laughs> anyway he was born in, as we know, in 1476. He was a sculptor, painter, architect, and a poet. He was born about 40 miles from uh, Florence. And his father's business was in banking. His, uh, I've, I wanted to make some uh, contrast between Greek and Italian art in a lot of ways, but not that often. This one is, I have three three images of, of Michelangelo. The first one is a painting. The second is a uh, bronze. And the th wait, third one is a bronze. The second one is a sculpture. The interesting thing is that the difference between Greeks and Italians was that Greeks were did a lot of ideal idealization. Everything was perfect. If you looked at... Um, their art and the Italians are the opposite. They let, they let it be what it is. So in this particular case on the left side, that's a painting. So they were able to make him look like he didn't have a messed up nose, which he did. <laughs> and the second and the third were more accurate to what he really looked like. Um, he, he was asked, let me see. I, I wanted to tell you more about his personality because he was a very much disliked person. Um, he was, uh, he had a lot of problems, but 
in this one, I just want to read you one of his poems. Um, Choice soul in whom as in a glass we see mirrored in thy pure form and delicate what beauties heaven and nature can create, the paragon of all their works to be. Fair soul in whom love, pity, piety have found a home, as with thy outward state, we clearly read and are so rare and great that they adorn none other like to thee. Anyway, that's part of a poem that he wrote. I have a section that's on the tortured genius, which is more recent, and it's talking about the problem because he had so many disagreements with so many people and had um, outbursts and all kinds of things. But anyway, there th th it's now thought very definitely that his family suffered from Asperger's syndrome. The men in Michelangelo's family displayed autistic traits and mood disturbances. His family described him as erratic and had trouble applying himself to anything. As a child and a young man, he did not get along with his family and suffered physical abuse. The artist was aloof and a loner. The artist mentor described Michelangelo as being unable to make friends and maintain any relationship. He did not attend his brother's funeral, which underlined his inability to show emotion. He was obsessed with work and controlling everything in his life, family, money, time. Loss of control caused him great frustration. He was able to generate in a short time many hundreds of sketches for the Sistine ceiling, no two alike, nor any pose similar. He gave his undivided attention to his masterpieces. He had difficult holding up his end of a conversation, often walking away in the middle of an exchange. He had a short temper, a sarcastic wit, and was paranoid at times. He was bad tempered and had an angry outbursts. This is, this is very interesting. He rarely bathed and often slept in his clothes, including his boots. He has sometimes gone so long without taking them off that when the, that the skin came off like a snake's when, when he removed his boots. <laughs> Michelangelo's single-minded work routine, usually lifestyle, limited interests, poor social communication skills and various issues of life control appearing to be the features of high functioning autism. One of the things that happened to him is he was, he was born in, outside of Florence, as I said. His mother died by the time he was six years old. His father was a banker, they're in the banking business, but they weren't, they weren't wealthy. And so they went back to Florence and he's a, you know, a magistrate, he was a mayor outside of Florence as the father. And then, he caught the eye of Lorenzo the Great, who um, Carol was talking about, the, the Medici, the Medici family. And he had this grand palace and he offered Michelangelo a place of his own within the palace as there were a few other students and he could do whatever he wanted in his studio. And um, let me see, I think, where, where are we in the slide? I think we should go forward. I've said this. Yeah, I've already said this. His mother died when he was six years old. To the next one, please. I'm sorry. Um, and so he's, you know, he was a self-proclaimed genius in art. He had 182 artworks, and I, I explained the um, his what, what they are deciding was his real problem of autism, Asperger's. Next slide, please. Um, so Lorenzo offered him his own place and they, and Lorenzo the Great loved Michelangelo. He just like, they had dinner every night. Um, Michelangelo grew up with some of the Lorenzo, uh, some of the Medici children. They, they studied together, all of that. And they would have dinner every night. And Lorenzo the Great was just fascinated by Michelangelo, which kind of, the next slide, please. Um, kind of disturbed um, some of the other students. And one of them was, let's see, I don't, I don't know where we are. Let's see, can we go forward? Those are the three people that had most influence on him. Ghiberti, Gerland Dio, and Bertoldo Giovanni. Giovanni had a student, um, I can't remember his name. He was also there, okay, this is the great, the next slide, please. 
Um, no, backwards. I'm sorry. I wanted to. I wanted to say these these three people, in contrast to Michelangelo saying that he is a you know he was his own person. He he didn't have anybody teaching him. He was he. These are the three people who had the most. He he worked under their tutelage. So Ghiberti, Ghirlandaio, and painting. And then he also was complaining that he didn't want to do the Sistine Chapel ceiling because he's not a painter, he's a sculptor. And then Bert, Bertoldi di Giovanni had this student that lived there also. This is called the most famous punch of the Renaissance. So living at the de' Medici Palace was master sculptor Bertoldo di Giovanni, um, Gio, Giovanni, I'm sorry the last living student of the great Renaissance sculptor Donatello. When Michelangelo arrived, the stu star's, uh, star pu pupil was someone named Pietro Torrigiani. Torrigiani. He was talented and three years older than Michelangelo. Anyway, one day as G Tor Torrigiani later related, both he and Michelangelo were sketching in, the in one of the chapels. And according to Torgiani, um, Michelangelo and he started getting into a little banter. He said that uh, Michelangelo had this way of, you know, trying to put you down, uh, try to be sarcastic, all of that. And he said he got, uh, Torgiani got so upset that he said he just busted him in the nose, which goes back to those first two uh, bronzes. He put, he, he clenched his fist. I gave him such a blow on the nose that I felt bone and cartilage go down like a biscuit beneath my knuckles. And this mark of mine, he will carry with him to his grave. And that was at the age of 17. So let's see, going on. Um, all right, this, the, in the Medici palace, as I was saying, he was given his own room. And they didn't discover this until 1975. Next, 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 please. Where he has uh, all of these doodles all over the walls, and nothing is the same. And one of them is very closely related to David. Um, but this room is just very interesting. Going on to the next page. This is another one where I was going to show you the difference between Greek and Italian artwork, that the Greeks had balance perfected. They were very idealized in all of their rendering. And as you can see, this Kretios boy, which is very famous from 500 BC, you know, a thousand years before the dying slave of Michelangelo, you can see it standing on its own two legs, or it was. And Italians always had to have something buttressing it to keep it up, otherwise it would fall down. Next slide, thank you. All right, so he, he this is before David, and this is um, Bacchus, and this is at the age of 21. He went to Rome the first time and of the two pieces in Rome are, are Bacchus and the Pietà. And this was commissioned by a high ranking cardinal, the uh, Bacchus. And because of the genitalia shown, it ended, get, ended up getting rejected by the church. And so some banker ended up buying it for his garden. And it's, um, it's showing again that he's being buttressed by something. He can't stand on his own two feet. Um, but that this is a body of a drunken, staggering God giving an impression of both youthfulness and femininity. Um, the strange blending of effects is a characteristic of the Greek God Dionysus. In Michelangelo's experience, sensuality of a divine nature has a drawback for man. In his left hand, the God holds with indifference a lion skin, which is a symbol of death, and a bunch of grapes, the symbol of life from which a fawn is feeding. 
Thus we are brought to realize in a sudden way what significance this miracle of pure sensuality has for man. Living only for a short while, he will find himself in a position of the fawn caught in the grasp of death, the lion's skin. 75 years later, after this was uh, in was sculpted, it ended up in Florence. Michelangelo said he was born a Florent Florentine and he'll die a Florentine, which he did. Do, um, John, do you want to stop for today? Um, sure. Well, let, let, let's take a pause and see what the uh, uh, group wants to do. Um, the uh, we, we can um, uh, discuss uh, what what we've heard today. May I say that um, you two have chosen great examples to get the major points across. You know, the, the, it's almost uh, overwhelming um, when, when you look at these two people, how can you get at the essence? And I think um, you both did uh, uh, that very well. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, Throw it open. I don't want to rush. Uh, we are uh, uh, have taped uh, an hour, and I'd like to take as much time uh, with these two people because they both exemplify the major points um, that Carol already made uh, explicitly, which which is what's going on uh, uh, with the Renaissance. The, the uh, people starting to think for themselves, not following the medieval uh, uh, theological philosophy that had all those steps leading up to God where humans were kind of in the middle. But the, these, these two guys are saying, no, humans, uh, humans are really important in their own right. They're not some middle step anywhere. Uh, and we're gonna celebrate humans. And I, you know, this really, uh, is so important because it presages the the next 500 years where we find ourselves now with uh, uh, humans and individual thinking for yourself. Well, that's that's a pretty good idea if you're educated and you're disciplined. But uh, thinking for yourself um, uh, uh, can be a problem, and we have two models in front of us now: uh, the United States and China with very different philosophies on thinking for, uh, for yourself. So um, uh, I, I think this is such an important moment um, in, in history that I wanna linger here um, as long as possible. And, and so uh, we'll, we'll take our time, Tina. You come back next week and do uh, take as much time as you want. We haven't even uh, got to the Sistine chapel where we, we dare uh, uh, to see uh, somebody paint a picture of God. Um, we, we saw it uh, uh, once earlier where somebody dared to paint a, a picture of God, but now this is big time. This is, the Pope has to look up at, uh, uh, at God. Of course, uh, uh, Colbert mimics that in, in his late night hour and his uh, frequent guest appearances of with God, which are are, are highly amusing, and and just uh, uh, remind me every time he does it of the of the Sistine Chapel. So uh, I I have a lot uh, more comments uh, uh, to make about what's what's been uh, said today. Um, uh, we can have a, a discussion period now, or. Uh, we can let Tina finish and then have a mega discussion uh, next week, which is uh, I'm kind of leaning in that direction, but I could be dissuaded. I think Tina, this is Carol. I think Tina has a lot more to um, cover. Mm. And so I want her to feel like she, you know, she can take a whole nother hour or two if she needs to, to, to cover. This is really great. And also you, you always, John, have really interesting um, ways of perspectives on what we've been talking about. So, and Timothy's here and he brought, he had great questions. So we want to take advantage of his uh, ability to join. So Timothy, are you in Colombia now? Or are you here? 
No, I'm here. Uh, I'm just on summer break. I, I'm a teacher, and we just uh, finished ah. school for the year, so so I can make these sessions again. Yeah, <laughs> I got a lot. I got a lot to catch up on, so I'll be listening to everybody on two times speed on YouTube yeah. for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> hey, Carolyn, you sound you sound much more normal in in regular life. Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm used to you talking twice as fast. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I should actually probably get going, but I'll, I'd happily come back next week and, and hear the rest of uh, Tina's lecture uh, from today. Yeah, well, thank you for doing all the teaching because that was a rough, that was rough, I'm sure. Yeah, um, yeah. And I appreciate the good, the good work. Um, and, but I, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna leave you guys. Also, I have, I just uh, chatted out a link to some botched uh, restorations in Spain. If oh, you want to laugh, if you want to laugh, great. just give a give a look at that. There, there's some pretty bad restorations. They're quite funny. So I, I, I must say, uh, in my uh, uh, pseudo teacher mode here, uh, when I see uh, my my students passing notes during class, <laughs> yeah, the, the Tim and Irene and little Ico were passing notes uh, in the chat section. Uh, and I don't dare uh, open the ch chat section because it, uh, it's going to uh, go into the uh, tape. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'll certainly open them before I, I, I stop taping, but uh, um, uh, I, I didn't want to open them in the middle of class. I thought it might be too disruptive. <laughs> no, you got to have the running commentary. It's uh, <laughs> it keep, keeps everybody fully engaged all the time. So it's a it's a new generation. Uh, yeah. Uh, no matter how annoying it is for the speaker. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I, I, I just took a quick look at that uh, video, you know, and it shows a picture. It's really hilarious. It looks like today's facial surgery gone bad. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're talking about the Guardian thing I just sent, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very funny. Um, all right. I got to go. I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye, okay. everybody. All right. Uh, see y'all next week. <laughs> Anything else, uh, uh, Tina and Carol? I thought it went very well. Oh, recording. I was also going to okay, say that. Uh, uh, wait, wait a minute. I'll stop recording here. <laughs>